You will be asked about it. How do you properly apply the free exercise of religion to the realm of politics? Hi, I'm Stuart Shepard, and this is First Liberty Live. This is the first in a series of episodes we'll be doing over the course of this year. We'll hit one every month or so, dealing with campaigns, election, and your faith, election season and your faith, and, and how you deal with that. How do you how do you bring your faith into that realm properly, legally? And we're going to be talking to experts from across the spectrum to get different points of views on this. And the first person up, of course, is Kelly Shackelford, our president, CEO, and chief counsel here at First Liberty Institute. Hi, Kelly. Hi, Stuart. All right, I'm going to start out with a hard one, okay? Uh, go right ahead. I used to work in TV news, and I, I keep I, I have a number of Facebook friends who are from those days 30 years ago. And let's just say they're not conservative. <laughs> and I love having them as friends because it reminds me there's another way of looking at the world, and Absolutely. it's just a refresher. So I, I try not to respond too much to their posts. But but this one I, I saw, and I wanted to, to unpack it, if you will, to, to analyze it. And so this is a meme that was shared. I wanted to get your analysis. It says, quote, explain it to me. It's snarky. Explain it to me like... Like we're in Sunday school. Why do millions of Christians, which you have to put in quotes, you know, when you do this, why do millions of Christians support the most unchristlike person ever? Now, the, the point of this is to get us fussing about politics, about campaigns, about candidates, about what's, what's a real Christian and all that. But there's a problem with this question. Help us understand, analyze the problem with the question. You're an attorney. You see right through this. What do you see? Well, I, I, there's a lot of problems with the question. First, I didn't know Satan was on the ballot, right? I mean, <laughs> the most unchristian. Uh, the other thing is, essentially, you're saying you can't vote for any sinner. Um, well, you know, that guy that means you can't vote for anybody. You can't vote for yourself. If yeah. I was on the ballot, I couldn't vote for me. But the the I think the getting more in depth in, into these things yeah. is why do people vote the way they vote or why should they? Why should a person of faith vote for one candidate over another? It's I think it's really complex, but I think there are two major sort of uh, folk eye uh, <laughs> focuses yeah. Yeah. Um, of of what they're looking at, and I think the most important by far is what will they do, not who they are. What will they do? What will the policies be they put in place? What will the people like? Let's say your president, which this person is referring to, you appoint a lot of people. You're not running day to day all these different things, but what policy and what people and what policies will they push through? Because that affects everything you really care about, you know, how much your taxes are, um, what kind of freedoms you have, whether there are good judges on the court or bad judges going on the court. I mean, we could just go on and on and on. Yeah. The policies are, I mean, the reason you're really voting on them is to do something. And so it's what they do. There also is a portion of their character, of who they are. Most of the reason for that being an issue is whether you can trust them to do what they say they're going to do. Because it doesn't help if they say, I'm going to do these policies, but they don't do it. Right. Again, We've seen that over and over again. In this presidential race, you really don't have that issue because you know what they're going to do. Each of them has a history, years of history, you've seen what they've done. And they, and they said what they were going to do, and they did either that or didn't do that. But the point is, you see whether they're trustworthy, what they will do, the type of things they will put in place. There is a small portion of, you know, just an example. What kind of example will they be or whatever? But I think that's small compared to the real reasons you're voting. And so this is a really simplistic uh, and false understanding. But people really should look at all these things. You should look at, you know, I don't like either one of these candidates. Bingo. They're both sinners. Bingo. Um, <laughs> They're human. What will they do? Yeah. I mean, and, and you know, the, the, I'll say this, too, because some people get so disgusted, they think, I'm just not going to vote. I've heard that. I, I hear it often. And, and for a person of faith, I would say, I would say, let me give you, a, you know, a, an analogy. Let's say you're the king and you have all power. And the person underneath you is killing innocent children. Uh, they are taking away people's freedoms. Um, they're taking their money from them after their hard-earned day of work. Uh, they are allowing 
small children to have sex reassignment surgeries. They're, we could just go on and on and on. The parents don't have the authority, the government does, et cetera, et cetera. And you're the king and you just watch. I think everybody would say, that's wrong. You, you should take action. You have the power. Right. Well, in this country, the voters, we have the power. And so if you don't vote, you're no, you're no different from that king. You, you are seeing evil occur underneath you and things that are harming people, and you are not lifting a finger to make sure that your understanding of right and wrong are in the votes that go in for all those elected officials. So it really isn't a, an option for a person of faith. It is a requirement to vote and to vote as you know biblically or, or or morally as you can and again i'm not talking about the person you're not endorsing the person <laughs> you're making a choice between the candidates. policies because yeah. it's going to affect so much i mean look we've got uh, a whole page dedicated to what we call supreme coup which is about people who want to totally change our courts which will really destroy our courts court packing adding four justices to the Supreme Court, adding 200 lower court judges, all in a political way, which will destroy the rule of law, the fact that we have courts, there's other countries, we have all the history there. We know what happens when you do this. There are people running, and this is what they will do if they win. It doesn't really matter who those people are if they're gonna do this. Uh, and so that's just one of a lot of issues, but it's a, it's a really important issue. So. It's the policies, it's what they will do. We are electing them to do things. And that's what people need to look at and try to realize that probably the only per perfect person in your mind is you. <laughs> I would do everything right, is what everybody thinks. Yeah. So, so you're not gonna have the perfect person. So look at what they will do, who they will put in place. Uh, there, one famous phrase uh, from a, a well-known conservative is, uh, people or personnel is policy. So your policy is really who you put in these positions. Uh, who, who will you, let's say you're a president, who will you pick as judges? Mm -hmm. Who will you pick as the you know, uh, Secretary of Defense? Who will you pick? All those people will really be the policy because they will follow a policy and throughout their all, all of their agencies. And it's the same way across the board. So. That is what the, the decision is really about. That's the voting. But not voting is not an option uh, unless you want to be in sin or, you know, in error or responsible. Um, because if people who know right and wrong don't vote, other people will fill that vacuum. Yeah. And so you're essentially giving power to them, kind of like the king who gives power to the second in command. So we have a responsibility. It, it might take a little bit of research on some of the – you can do it. You could do it if it meant maybe a thousand dollars on something at your house. So I think you can do it for all these these elected officials. And we're trying to choose the one that's and not just talking about presidential race, talking about all the races. Yes. We're just trying as Christians to pick the one that's better. -er. Yes. The best is not available. I right. mean, perfect is not available. So we have to choose the better -er one. And sometimes all the, the the best choice, the better -er one, is the one that's at least friendly toward my values. Right. No matter how they live personally, at least their policies are friendly toward what I think is valuable. I, it's also important, I think, for people to understand when you see questions like this one that I shared uh, from online, the root of that is a book from uh, way back. It's a guy named Saul Alinsky. He was a crazy leftist. He wrote a book called Rules for Radicals, and one of those rules was make the enemy live up to its own book of rules. That's what's underneath that question. They're trying to say, aha, you're a Christian, so, and th then the person speaking decides what your rules ought to be and say, you got to live up to those rules. Just reject that. Throw it out. It's, it's a false premise from the start because, frankly, that's not how Christianity works. It's, no. a, it's a false understanding of that. Okay, I'm going I'm to give you a series of questions here that people often wonder about churches and pastors and all that, and just want to get your advice as someone who's dealt with this for many years as a legal expert. Can pastors talk about hot-button issues from the pulpit? There's zero, zero question on that. Um, they can talk about whatever they want. I mean, they, they have total freedom under the First Amendment. Uh, and let me, let me sort of set a two, uh, I guess, sort of a first issue and then a second issue. Okay. Number one, this is something that very few people understand. 
churches, houses of worship, are tax exempt in the IRS code as a matter of law if they're a church. Okay. You're talking about beyond registering as a 501c3. Yes. Up in here. 501c3 tax exempt was created really for people who weren't churches because you're not sure if they fit the definition of serving a public purpose like charities and things do. So you have to actually fill out forms, you have to apply, you have to be approved as a 501c3. Right. Nonprofit. Churches don't have to do that. They, they are in the code. This is not like a theory or something I'm reading into the code, right? Yeah. And this has been in cases. They made this very clear. Churches are tax exempt if they're a church, period. End of story. So they can really do whatever they want, um, number one. But many churches, many houses of worship are also 501c3s because they just wanted to apply and show people that. I, and I think part of that is they don't understand if you're a church, you don't have to show anybody anything, but they like having it. So they file their tax deal every year, which they don't have to do, yeah. uh, and they have this paper. And that allows people who make donations to get the paper to show that they get a deduction. But they get a deduction anyway, if they want it, just because they're a church. So yeah. I say this, so what we're going to be talking about now is, if you're a 501c3, what can you do with regard to your 501c3? But even, and there's a famous case on this, even if you put a full page ad in USA Today and Washington Post. Which actually happened. Which actually I've been saying, if you vote for Bill Clinton, you're voting for Satan. I mean, that's kind of an endorsement. Yeah, it's, it's an anti-endorsement, <laughs> but right. the IRS sees it the same way. Even if you do that, which clearly would violate 501c3, the court said, it's kind of semantics though, because even if you don't have a 501c3, Churches are automatically tax exempt anyway. So that's what I want people to understand first. There's really nothing for a church to be fearful about. Okay. They have the authority. But if you're worried about the 501c3, can a pastor speak to these issues and, and, and not have a 501c3 issue? Yes, the pastor can speak about whatever they want. You can have a voter's guide that is you know, available that lets people know, here's how the candidates stay on the issues. A nonpartisan voters guy. That's right. You can't say, well, vote for this person, vote. Yeah. But you can do a real voters educational. Yeah. Uh, you can register people to vote, uh, which many churches do. Not an issue with 501c3. Um, really, the only restrictions that are there for a 501c3 are you can't endorse one candidate over another or give resources to one candidate over another. Again, I haven't seen very many churches wanting to endorse, you know, First Baptist Church of blah, 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 endorses candidate A. I just haven't seen that. Um, and I haven't seen, hey, we'd like to open our church coffers to the politicians. <laughs> I haven't seen that either. Yeah. So really the things people even are scared about with 501c3s are non-issues. Um, the things that are prohibited are things that, that churches and houses of worship don't really have any interest in doing now. The sort of the the one that is in the you know that that the IRS would argue about is can the pastor as an individual endorse from his pulpit from from the pulpit, and the IRS would say no because you're kind of using the 501c3 resources. But they've never challenged. They it don't when want. It's happened. They, they don't, don't want to want fight that it. case because they'll lose. Um, again. I think even under a 501c3, a pastor can endorse whoever they want. It's and the impression I've entity. had is that the chilling effect of people being afraid of losing the 501c3 status is what's kept them from employing their First Amendment right to speak freely. If we have a right to free speech in this country, you should be able to say what you it, want. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of fear that's based upon nothingness. I mean, it's, it's irrational fear, and so it's self-censorship. Look. People are going to disagree about whether it's good theology for a pastor to stand in the pulpit and endorse somebody. And congregations can decide what they think about that. That's religious freedom. Yeah. That's religious freedom. Not the IRS telling you. Um, and so, I mean, do you really think the IRS wants a case over a regulation they have versus the power of the First Amendment and the pulpit of a church in the United States of America? That is a... 
that is a for sure loser for the IRS. So that's why they don't want everybody we represented so far. You know, they've backed down. And, and by representative, you're talking about pastors who have endorsed a candidate from the pulpit. Yes. The IRS hasn't taken the. They, they don't want that fight because they'll lose and they know they'll lose. And then it'll be clear to everybody, which should be already clear. And again, this whole discussion we're having yeah. is about 501c3. And they don't even have to be a 501c3. So I just want churches to understand they they have to decide what they feel theologically, biblically, whatever that they want to do or should do. But there are no limitations. I mean, and and look, we go back to the founding in this country. There were election sermons before every election. Yep, I've read them. I mean, if the pastor's not willing to stand up and tell people to vote, tell people it's their responsibility, I mean, you know, the, the question about uh, Christians. A Christian is supposed to represent Christ in every aspect of life. And that includes in the voting booth. And if the pastor is supposed to help them, equip them to do that. And this is part of it. Yeah. Part of it is saying you need to vote. You need to do your homework. God is giving you a precious gift in this country. And we are supposed to steward this. And how we do will depend upon whether our kids and our grandkids get this precious gift. Every pastor should do their part to talk about this. Uh, they should talk, certainly talk about all the issues that are biblical issues. Um, if they're in politics, it's irrelevant. Who cares? I mean, it, it's, if it's a moral and biblical issue, it's a moral and biblical issue, which most of these things are. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, but it's just odd. A lot of the thinking that seeped in is somehow it's, it's not, you know, it's not good to be involved in politics. And you, you almost want to say, do you think it's good to help a poor person? Well, yeah. But what if you could help a million poor people? by the policy you passed. Oh, well, I guess, you know, yeah. this is just being a good steward with what God's given people. And the pastors have every freedom to lead in that and to teach their congregation and to encourage them. I, I have seen some amazing turnarounds in communities because the pastors decided to do this. They didn't even tell people who to vote for. They didn't say that. They just started talking about the importance of voting and the importance of, of voting by using their values and their biblical understandings and the policies that would come into place. And they've just totally revamped and changed entire communities. So it's huge, especially when you look at the small turnout in a lot of these uh, races by people, you know, who uh, call themselves Christians and go to these churches and they don't, that most, you know, they're not registered and they don't vote. Uh, uh, you look at the primaries, especially. I mean, it can be as low as like ten percent, uh, and so, so it, it's a huge difference if people who who know right and wrong will go and vote with those principles. I've got a series of questions here, and you've already answered quite a few of them along the way there as you were talking about all that. But I, I want to go through and just get a, a brief snippet on each one, okay? You talked about, a, I believe, pastors serving on a campaign team. That's yeah. okay, right? Pastor can do whatever they want in their private capacity, yes. All right. all right. Endorsing a candidate, you dealt with that pretty thoroughly already. Uh, voter registration, yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, a lot of churches do this. Every church should. Voter guides? Voter guides are fine as long as they're not partisan. Again, what we're saying, fine or not fine, is whether you're a 501c3 or not. Right. And these are nonpartisan educational voter guides, which, right. are, which are readily available. Um, and you mentioned this, inviting candidates to come speak. Yeah. What, what, what are the rules around that you as can far invite, as the is concerned? You can invite uh, the candidates. If you invite, again, this is for your C3 issue, yeah. you can invite the candidates to any race you wish. You just need to invite all of them. Now, if only one shows up. There you go. That's fine. If more show up and you want to do question and answer so people can figure out what the that's difference is. That's fun. <laughs> that's fine, too. Church, churches have, yeah. and 501c3s of all sorts have every right to do that. Very good. Uh, what does the IRS say? And you've dealt with this some, but what do they say that a church cannot do? This is just to be very clear about this under the 501c3 status, if that's what you're fretting about. At, under a 501c3, you're not supposed to endorse or oppose one candidate over another and you're not supposed to give resources or money to one candidate over another and that's it that's it and it, and we're talking about the 501c3 entity not people who 
you know, are connected with the fund. So that's why we say the pastor can be the campaign manager for somebody. In his private capacity. Right. But it's just, this is the church entity can't endorse. The church entity can't give resources to one over another or, or any 501c3. And to be absolutely clear, members, pastors outside of the building and outside of a, a service can say whatever they want, right? And they can even do it during the service. I mean, they can say whatever they want. I mean, the idea that like two people in the back uh, before church in the foyer talking can't talk about politics is, you know, is pretty a pretty big violation of the First Amendment to try that. Now, yeah. nobody's ever tried that. So, uh, so yeah, there's a lot of fear, and it's 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 so misplaced on so many levels. Uh, but, you know, uh, there's a lot of things that our houses of worship can do, and they should be doing those things. We need them to do those things. I mean, most of the huge policy changes in our country came out of houses of worship, whether it's the civil rights movement, the women's suffrage movement, the child labor laws. The, I mean, we could go on and on. It's the, the moral conscience of your country. Yeah. And if they are silent, I mean, we, we suffer as a country. So... Uh, they need to do their part, and uh, and they need to tell everybody in those congregations to get out and vote. And I'm going to give you a chance just to share directly to encourage people to vote. Look right into the camera and tell us why we should get out there. Well, uh, there's there's no reason for anybody to sit home uh, who knows right and wrong. We we so need people to pick leaders who will follow policies that, especially with First Liberty, that are going to protect freedom going to protect the freedom of your kids, your grandkids. Um, if, let's say, there there's somebody who um, is going to pick judges for life, whether a president, a, a U.S. senator, uh, that's a huge deal. What kind of judges are they going to pick? Are they going to pick judges that, you know, will uphold parental rights, will uphold religious freedoms, will uphold free speech? Will, I mean, we could go down a long list of constitutional rights. Will they defend those or will they actually weaken those or take those away? And even in other seats, will they reform the courts? Will they, you know, uh, change? Will they put term limits on the courts, which throws out Justice Thomas, Justice Alito, and uh, Chief Justice Roberts? Those are the three oldest. What a coincidence. Uh, are they going to pack the court? Uh, are they, I mean, we could just go on and on. The point is, voting really matters for whether you like the candidates or not, the policies and what they will do dramatically impact you and your freedoms and the freedoms of your kids and your grandkids. So I encourage you not only vote, but take others you know who know right and wrong, who can make a difference, and give them any information you have. We need everybody out there having a, making a difference, making sure that this incredible country we have and the freedoms that it's based upon uh, don't go away for our, ki our kids and our grandkids. Very good. Thank you, Kelly. Appreciate yeah. you. Absolutely. Appreciate the work you, you do. If you want to see America's religious heritage defended, would you consider partnering with us here at First Liberty Institute? This is what we do. Just look for the big red Give button up at the top of the page. First Liberty is fighting for what matters most.